Good morning. Larry King here with you with the Word of Faith Fellowship. So happy to be here to share my heart, share whatever God's doing in my heart, our testimonies. And our prayer and our hope is that what we share bears witness with you and is able to help you in your daily walk. And um, it just brings you hope um, and lets you know that you're not alone, that we all, we're all we all on the same level, that we all need Jesus to make it. Um, God's been speaking to my heart <clears throat> the last, I don't know, maybe month with everything that's going on in the world today with uh, just with the lawlessness and uh, and people, uh, especially young people coming against authority. Um, the the value, the, the recognition and the appreciation of God's delegated authority. <clears throat> so I'm going to share some scriptures with you this morning <clears throat> or some testimonies about authority, God's delegated authority. And I think a lot of people in the world, they have the, the wrong interpretation of, of authority. Uh, you know, you do have some people that are in authority that they lord it over, but it's not, not supposed to be that way in the body of Christ. Um, you know, people that walk in authority in the body of Christ, they're, they're, they're the servants. <clears throat> they're the servants of God's people. And and um, so let me just start off right here in First Thessalonians chapter 5, um, in verse 12. It says, Now also we beseech you, brethren, get to know those who labor among you. Recognize them for what they are. Acknowledge and appreciate and respect them all. Your leaders who are over you in the Lord and those who warn and kindly reprove and exhort you. And see, we have a lot of in the world right now that people, they don't want to be warned. They don't want to be reproved. They don't they don't like the exhortation. They they basically they just let me just do what I want to do. And, you know, they don't want to be told what to do. And and it says right here that we have people that God have put, you know, our fathers, our grandmothers, or whoever it is that God have, has placed in that place of authority, which you can say authority, responsibility, because God, it's a God-given responsibility where they are supposed to be faithful stewards and servants to help me, to help you. It says love and appreciate them, respect them. You know, there's not a lot of respect right now in the world right now for <clears throat> for the for you know, be it police or school teachers or principals. It's it's like there's not a lot of respect. It says in verse thirteen, it says and hold them in very high and most affectionate esteem and intelligent and sympathetic appreciation of their work. So you can be at peace among yourself. I mean, God wants us to appreciate those that that God has put in our lives to help guide us and lead us and exhort us and encourage us and realize that, you know, they've been through the same thing. God put them in that place of responsibility and they're going to have to answer to God. In Romans 13, it says, let every person be loyally subject to the governing civil authorities for there is no authority except from God by his permission, his sanction, and those that exist do so by God's appointment. That goes worldwide. And that goes worldwide. God puts people in places of authority, responsibility. We can, authority and responsibility, they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. The reason that uh, people are in a place of authority is because they've taken responsibility. And God wants to use that person to be able to help others come up in a place in God where they can be responsible. It says that every person be loyal subject. It says there's no authority except by God's permission, his sanction. And those that exist, exist do so do so by God's appointment. Therefore, he who resists sets himself up against the authorities, resists what God has appointed and arranged in divine 
order. And those who resist, resist will bring down judgment upon themselves, receiving the penalty due, due them. You, you see that? It says... Those that resist, you don't have to resist. It's it, but I think what I have, a lot of times people think is that you know uh, this person is just trying to tell me what to do. They just want to. They want me to be their slave. They want me to come under subjection, and they rebel against it. The whole thing about authority or responsibility is the love of God. You can feel the love of God coming from someone. And, and my dad, he was the principal at Rutherford County here, and it's like he had students all the time that, you know, came from a broken home or, you know, it only had, you know, one parent, either the mother or the or the father, or they were raised by the grandparents. And he looked at his job as a ministry, as an outreach, you know, of someone that can, it can fill that void and that balance. And he began to show the love of God to the students around and begin to share with them. And what happens is that when you do that, when you were walking in that place and you're walking that place of responsibility, authority, students, people feel that and they begin to have that trust. They begin to have that trust that they can trust you, they can tell you things, or they'll listen to you. They'll they'll heed your warnings. You know, he would walk by, he would say, you know, you know, you don't want to be doing that. And it's like, and that was the what does it say up there? Kindly reprove and exhort. Kindly reprove and exhort. It's not a lording over. It's a it's a warning. Heed the warning. I'm telling you, the path that you're walking down, it's not a good path. And a lot of times people don't want to hear that because they want to do what they want to do and they don't want to listen to anybody. Verse 3 says, For civil authorities are not a terror for, of people of good conduct, but to those of bad behavior. Would you have no dread of him who is in authority? Then do what is right and you will receive his approval and commendation for Verse 4, this is Romans 13, 4. For he is God's servants for your good. It's for our good. It's for my good. But if you do wrong, you should dread him and be afraid, for he does not bear and wear the sword for nothing. And this is, you know, of course, this is in, you know, back in the biblical, you know, whenever Jesus was, you know, had come to the earth, talking about a sword. He is God's servant to execute his wrath and punishment, vengeance on the wrongdoer. It does, but you don't have to have the wrath and punishment. You don't have to be a wrong wrongdoer. It's only those that resist and come against what God has ordained. Therefore, one must be subject not only to avoid God's wrath and escape punishment, but also as a matter of principle and for the sake of conscience. It doesn't have to be that way. I mean, God gives us many, many opportunities that we don't have to, that we can escape the punishment or the judgment. You know, it says the wages of sin is death. You repeatedly give yourself to, to rebellion or things that you know in your heart of hearts that are wrong. Then the authorities come in, those that take responsibility, those that have the, the law of the land will come in, and you, then you will reap the fruit. And there will be punishment, but it doesn't have to be that way. God gives us so many opportunities before that judgment come and the judgment comes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, you know, um, I talked about this. This is talking about trust. So, um, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. So then let us apostles or teachers be looked upon as ministering servants of Christ and stewards trustees of the mysteries and the secret purposes of God. Did you hear that? It says we are ministering servants. You are a ministering servant. Just think about it. I know wherever you are right now, if, you know, if you're a parent, you have children under under you that you that God wants you to set the example for. If you're a child, I know you have a sibling, someone that's under you that looks up to you. It says right there, Whatever it is, if you're an older brother or, you know, if you're a, a, a cousin, an older cousin, if you're an uncle, if you're a mother, we all have responsibilities. We all have someone underneath us that looks up to us that God wants us to set the example for. So 
It says, we're to be looked upon as ministering servants, stewards, trustees of the mysteries and the secret purposes of God. Moreover, it is essentially required by of stewards that a man should be found faithful, proving himself worthy of trust. Let's stop right there. God wants us to prove ourselves worthy of trust. And when that happens, when we prove ourselves worthy of trust, God gives us more and more responsibility. Think about the parable of the talents. You know, every one of the of the servants, the bond servants, they had the same amount of talents. And one took it and took and he produced five more, another ten more, another one. They didn't do anything with that talent. And what happened, the one, the, the, the talent that he had, it was taken from him and given to the one that took the most repos- responsibility and was trusted. And it goes another way. And whenever you take responsibility and people start to notice that and they feel the love of God coming from you, they can trust you more. They feel like they can trust you because you're setting the example and they'll listen and they'll heed what you're saying. Moreover, in verse 2, it is essentially required of stewards that a man should be found faithful, proving himself worthy of trust. And up above there, it talks about steward, a steward, a trustee, a steward. The definition of a steward is to manage or look, look after another's property. And that's what we all are. We, we're not our own. You're not your own. The people that you're around are not their own. They are another's property. We are the property of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God wants us to be faithful stewards of his property, which are his people. Me, you, the whole world. In Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, um, verse 7, it says, Remember your leaders and superiors in authority, for it was they... Who brought to you the word of God. Observe attentively and consider their manner of living, the outcome of their well-spent lives, and imitate their faith. Let's back up. Remember your leaders, your superiors in authority. The authority, remember, are those that have taken responsibility and God has trusted and trusted as a trustee for it. They're the ones that brought you the word of God. I remember when I came here, I'm so grateful for Jane Bailey that she began to share the word of God. And as I began to sit there, it began to bear witness with me what she was sharing. And it began to have, I began to get convicted of my lifestyle and the things that I was, I was doing. You know, she was preaching about sin and, and it's like I had, you know, I had grown up in the church but I, I had become so alienated and estranged and far away from God that when she was preaching about you don't have to sin, I had gotten so far gone. I didn't, what is she talking about? Sin? What is sin? I was just living my life as a natural carnal man. So it says she was bringing forth the word of God. It says, how, what is it? There's a song we sing. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of them. Who bring good news, good news. So she was bringing the good news. So I looked up to her and many others because they were bringing the word of God. And that was, I I didn't even know this scripture then. It says, but you know what I also did? I began to attentively observe and consider their manner of living. Because they were sharing, she was preaching, different ones were sharing, and and they would share, but not only would they share things that convicted me, but they were living what they were sharing. And I had, you know, I grew up in the church, uh, and I began to watch pastors and teachers, and they began to preach, but they didn't practice, you know. So it's like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And it's like it, it produced a, you know, a double standard and you know, confusion. It's like they would preach one thing. But I would observe, attentively observe their lifestyle, and they would do the opposite as soon as they stepped out of the pulpit. And, you know, that, that's, what, you know that's what you call a hypocrite. It says, um, and imitate their faith, their conviction that God exists and is the creator and the ruler of all things, the provider 
um, and bestower of eternal salvation through Christ and their leaning of the entire human personality on God in absolute trust. There the word is again, trust and confidence in his power, wisdom and goodness. If, uh, jump to verse 17. Obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them continually, recognizing their authority over you. I want to make sure you understand, you know, you hear authority and it's like people's minds think of Lord over. Again, it's not being a Lord. It's being that servant, someone that that takes that time, that lays down their life and and exhorts and encourages, takes responsibility for they are constantly keeping watch over your souls and guarding your spiritual warfare, uh, welfare as men who will have to render an account of their trust. There it is again, trust. Do your part to let them do this with gladness, not with sighing and groaning, for that would not be profitable to you either. Think about Moses whenever God, you know, the thing about authority is, if you know, if you go through the Bible and you 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 look at the, the patriarchs, the ones that um, that God used and place in in places of responsibility, they weren't seeking authority. They were just thinking. They were just living their life, serving God. And just Moses, you know what was he doing? You know, and he saw the burning bush, and God chose him to deliver his people out of Egypt. But he wasn't seeking it. And he, and he, a lot of times the people, if you read the Bible, you got um, Gideon, you got Moses, they're like, well, who am I? <clears throat> there was a humility there that they realized that they wouldn't be able to do anything apart from him. You know, Moses, he did, he did, he did, he, and the place in his heart is, he's like, no, send somebody else. I can't speak. You know, he, he kept going, no, God chose you. Most of the time in the Bible, when people, are placed in that place of authority. Look at David. David was out. He was out tending the sheep, just out tending the sheep. He wasn't out there thinking, "I want to be authority. I want to be, you know, the the leader. I want to be the king of Israel." You know, he wasn't even thinking that. All he was thinking was taking responsibility. And what happens is, a man's gift makes room for itself. They're, you're not seeking authority. You're just think, seeking, taking responsibility for whatever it is that God has set before you that day. And when you do that, God, you know, God recognizes it. Man recognizes it. And, you know, promotions, with, you know, for lack of a better word here, they come from God. God, you know, he humbles himself. God exalts. But it's not out of out of any kind of pride and haughtiness. It's just out of because you love God and you want to be responsible. And what does it say there? That we'll have to have to render account of our trust, and and we need to do it without sighing and groaning. It says in James chapter three, verse one, that not many of us would become teachers, self constituted censors and reprovers other of others. My brethren, for you know that we teachers, okay, that's in, in brackets there. We can put parents, grandparents, uh, brothers, sisters, you know, whatever. We teachers, we people, we who are taking responsibility will be judged by a higher standard and with greater severity than other people. Thus, we assume the greater accountability and the more condemnation. There's a great accountability on this. Whenever, um, whenever we take responsibility and and we don't, you know, uh, uh, uplift and set that good example of godly, holy living, there's a greater accountability on us. Because what did Jesus say in the in the in the Word of God? He says, "Don't don't I mean don't cause a little one to stumble." You don't want to cause somebody to stumble by your lifestyle. I mean, I, I take that very serious. I mean, trust, I mean, for someone to trust you, that means a lot. We are worthy of our trust. It means a lot. Out of that place, God can trust you. If God can't trust you, then man can't trust you. It, it means a whole lot. And um, in Ephesians chapter 4, um, 
So it says that uh, in verse 11, and his gifts were varied. That means we all had different gifts. He himself appointed and gave men to us. God gave us gifts through men. God gave us men. And it goes on to talk about some were apostles, special masters, some were prophets, some evangelists, preachers of the gospel, some pastors, and some teachers. Why did he do that? It says his intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints, his consecrated people. Why does God give us these, these people of authority, responsibility? Because his intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints, his consecrated people, that they should do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body, the church. That's our responsibility. That's why it gives, God gives us authority, responsibility. They go hand in hand. They go together. It says so that we can build up his church. Verse 13, that it might develop until we all, all attain oneness. That's one thing I, that people notice about the word of faith. Um, you know, when we're out in the community, uh, if we're playing basketball, softball, we have so many people come to us. What is it about y'all? Y'all, y'all just feel together. I can feel the oneness with you. It's because we love Jesus and we love each other and we are our brother's keeper. When the when one's, one's down, we pick them. That's one thing that, you know, we played a lot of softball. A lot of the other teams, they they wanted to play with us because they realized that, you know, you know we don't do everything right, you know, out there. A ball, we may drop a ball, a ball go between our legs, or we should have caught. We lift each other up. And they, they see that, and they, they want to be a part of that. It's called the oneness. It's because we are our brother's keeper. We are uh, responsible and we care and that's what God that's what God has ordained and has set in order it says and we all may att- until we all attain oneness in the faith and the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the son of God that we might arrive at really mature manhood the completeness of personality which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection the measure of the stature of the fullness that Christ and the completeness found in him. Did you hear that up above? Mature manhood. You know, you have grown men that still, in their actions, they act like a child. So, you know, maturity has nothing to do with age. You know, you got 50, 60, 70 year old men that still need, it's called spiritual maturity. It's spiritual maturity. That's what God is looking for. It says in verse 14, so then, so why did God do this? Why did God give us these people of authority, responsibility? It says, so then we may long, may no longer be children tossed like ships to and fro between chance gusts of teaching and wavering with every change in wind and doctrine, the prey of the cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous men, gamblers engaged in every shifting form of trickery and inventing errors to mis- mislead. God does that, you know, gives us that. So we don't, we're not deceived. We're not, you know, like Eve in the garden. God, God you know, he, she got out from under authority, which was her husband, and she was misled. You can go through all through the Bible, and what happens when someone gets out from under the authority and the responsibility of God, it says they become like this in verse 14, tossed like ships. They, you know, what, what does it say? A ship without a sail. And they can be misled, and they can be deceived. And God doesn't, and God doesn't want that. God doesn't want that for us. God wants us to be stable, steadfast, and I watch that with people that have taken, when I first came here, I began to watch that. I began to watch those different ones that they had a stability. They had that. They weren't like me. They weren't like roller coasters up and down and, you know, and I, that's what I wanted. I observed their lifestyle and I began to position myself where I could be around them. I could hear from them. I could learn from them and they began to help me. And I had that respect because I observed their lifestyle. And um, 
let's look at this verse over in um, Matthew. Matthew 7 is talking about Jesus here. He said, uh, he was, I think it's five and six of Matthew, he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And when Jesus had finished these sayings, it says, the Sermon on the Mount, the crowds were astonished and overwhelmed with bewildered wonder at his teaching. Why? For he was teaching as one who had and was authority and not as did the scribes. Did you hear that? Because, you know, Jesus always, and he had so much love in his heart and he had so many, he had the multitudes around him and the scribes and the Pharisees, they couldn't stand it. They could not stand it. It says in uh, John 5, it says, you know, the reason that he had so much authority and he was speaking to someone that had authority and not like the scribes, John chapter 5, verse 39, he, Jesus is, is talking to the scribes and Pharisees. He says, you search and investigate and pour over the scriptures diligently. And that's what the scribes and Pharisees did, the religious leaders that were supposed to be in authority, because, because you suppose and trust that you have eternal life through them. And these very scriptures testify about me, and still you are not willing but refuse to come to me so that you might have life. I receive not glory from men. I crave no human honor. I look for no mortal thing. And see, a lot of times with people that we see that are placed in these places of authority and responsibility, they're looking for a name for themselves. I won't have time to get to it today, but if you go look over in Matthew 23, it describes exactly of those, uh, the scribes and Pharisees, how they love to be greeted in the synagogue and being called rabbi. And it's like, but Jesus said, I seek no mortal fame. I'm not seeking to be famous. We should be seeking a name for ourselves. All we want to do, it says, we want Jesus to be lifted up is what we want. But um, in verse 41, but I know and recognize and understand that you have not the love of God in you. That's real critical. Real key is that we have the love of God, the love for God and the love for God's people in our hearts. And God will give us the responsibility, that authority. I want to close with this scripture here. It's, um, it's over in, um, it's over in John, John chapter one. John chapter 1, it talks about in the beginning, before all time, the, the Word was with God, and the world was with God, and the Word was God himself. It said, all things were made and came into existence through him, and without him not even one thing made was would come into being. In him, which is Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines on, shines on in darkness, for the darkness has never overpowered it, put it out, or absorbed, or appropriated it, or and is unreceptive to it. Verse 9, there it was, the true light, which is Jesus, was then coming into the world, the genuine, perfect, steadfast light that illumines every person. He came into the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize and did not know him. That's very sad. He came to that which belonged to him, to his own, his domain, his creation, things, the world, and they who were his own did not receive and did not welcome him. That's a sad state. It said, God so loved the world that he gave his son, all you know, that we should welcome him, receive him into our hearts. But, verse 12, this, we got hope, but to as many as did receive and welcome him, we want to receive and welcome Jesus in our hearts. He gave the authority. Do you hear that? He gave the authority. In parentheses, it says the power, the privilege, the right to become the children of God. That is to those who believe, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. It says, as many as just receive him, he gave authority. When you receive Jesus, you receive Jesus, you walk with Jesus, he gives you that authority, that responsibility, not for you to, for you to be exalted and to lift, be lifted up to what we talk about, building up Christ's body. 
who, who, in verse 13, earl their birth, neither to blood nor to the will of flesh, that of physical impulse, nor to the will of man, that of a natural father, but to God. They are born of God. And that's what God wants for us. God wants us to be born of him. God wants us to be born again controlled by his spirit so we can walk in that place of responsibility and authority that God has given us. I hope that blessed you today. Um, I just pray that, you know, just just let God speak to your heart. Go back in the scriptures and look at those different places of where God had given people that responsibility and he gives you more and more as you begin to prove your, your, your trust. So, so glad to be with you this morning. I uh, hope it blessed you. Um, you can go to these radio programs on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're with you from 830 to 9. Have a blessed day.